reading about the mystic Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman was a mentor and pastor to many of the leaders of the civil rights movement in the, in the 1960s. He influenced their thought and feelings about nonviolence because of a trip he made to India where he met Gandhi. He spoke to them about prayer and social action. So I want to start with these words from Howard Thurman because he believed that we needed to be still and quiet in the presence of God, that stillness and quiet could give us the confidences we needed to figure out our purpose in life, to go forward and change the world to reflect the kingdom of God. So he said, in the stillness of the quiet, if we listen, we can hear the whisper of the heart giving strength to weakness, courage to fear, hope to despair. Welcome to worship. All are welcome and all are invited and all are a beloved child of God. God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting the mountains and breaking the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. There then came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? How good it is to center down by Howard Thurman from Meditations from the Heart. How good it is to center down, to sit quietly and see oneself pass by. The streets of our minds seethe within this traffic. Our spirits resound with clashings, with noisy silence. While something deep within hungers and thirsts for the still moment and the resting lull. With full intensity we seek ere the quiet passes a fresh sense of order in our living. A direction, a strong, sure purpose that will structure our confusion and bring meaning in our chaos. We look at ourselves in the waiting moment. The kind of people we are, the question persists. What are we doing with our lives? What are the motives that order our day? What is the end of our doings? Where are we trying to go? Where do we put the emphasis and where are our values focused? For what end do we make sacrifices? Where is my treasure and what do I love most in life? What do I hate most in life? And to what am I true? Over and over the questions beat in upon the waiting moment as we listen. Floating up through the jangling echoes of our turbulence, there is a sound of another kind, a deeper note which only the stillness of the heart makes clear. It moves directly to the core of our being. Our questions are answers, our spirits refreshed, and we move back into the traffic of our daily round with the peace of the eternal in our step. How good it is to center down. So there's a story that Howard Thurman tells about when he was young. He was caught in a summer thunderstorm as a young boy. He had been out picking berries and filling his bucket with those berries. 
and plunge deeper and deeper in the forest, searching out the best, the sweetest, the ripest berries. And he lost in that wonderful feeling of hunting berries and experiencing the outdoors. He didn't notice that a storm had come up upon him until he heard the crashing of thunder. And then he realized that he was lost and normally that wouldn't be a problem because he could wander his way home. But now a thunderstorm was coming with lightning. And so he started to panic as the darkness started to envelop him and he began to run. Then he remembered a family bit of wisdom that had been told to him. When you're lost, stop and be still then look around and listen. When you're lost, stop and be still and then look around and listen. And Thurman stood still observing the lightning strikes, illuminating the landscape, looking left and right, backward and forward until he saw something familiar that he could walk his way through. And after each lightning strike, he would head in that new direction because he had stopped and been still and looked and listened. And so with each lightning strike, he made his way closer and closer to his home. Howard Thurman discovered that even storms can provide us with a divine wisdom if we pause long enough to notice them. Do you remember a prophet who had an experience of a storm? Who needed to find the quiet center and get to the stillness. There's a story told about Elijah who was involved in the chaos and political intrigue because he spoke out against the king and the queen and so he fled and it was being chased and he holed up in a cave and God came to him on that mountain and said, go stand out on the mountain before God, for the Lord is about to pass by. So Elijah got up and stood out on the mountain waiting for the Lord to pass by. And a great wind came so strong that it split the mountains and broke rock pieces before God. But God wasn't in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was fire, but God wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sheer, still silence. When Elijah heard the silence, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of cave. And then there came to him a voice that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah didn't find God in all the extreme activity. He didn't find God in the wind and the earthquake and the fire. He found God in this sheer, sheer still silence. Howard Thurman has a lot to teach us about stillness and quietness, of centering ourselves within God's presence. He began to believe that all things were connected and united, that the universe binds us together as a young boy, Howard Thurman developed a unique relationship with his oak tree, a great oak tree in his backyard. Through storm and wind snapped at its branches, the tree, to, the tree stood tall and gave strength to Howard Thurman. Looking back on his youth, Thurman wrote this. I could sit my back against its trunk and feel that same peace that would come to me in my bed at night. I could reach down in the quiet places of my spirit, take out my bruises and my joys, unfold them, 
and talk about them. I could talk aloud to the oak tree and know that I was understood. It too was part of my reality, like the woods, the night, and this pounding surf. My earliest companions giving me space. Howard Thurman used to talk about his grandmother who was born a slave and then freed. And what the story that she told to her grandchildren over and over again was she would say that a preacher would come through. And after he was done teaching and preaching, he always looked at them. He always looked at them and he said, you are not a slave. You are not the worst name that they call you. You are a beloved child of God. She wanted to instill in Howard Thurman that he, no matter what happened in the world around him, that he was a beloved child of God. And because he had this natural sense of being present, in the world of sensing the spirit and God in the outdoors. He used to say that it is in the moment of mystical vision, there is a sense of community, a unity not only with God, but a unity with all life, particularly human life. Listen to how Howard Thurman's experience of the divine unity of all things. Here's how he explained it. As a boy in Florida, I walked along the beach of the Atlantic in the quiet stillness that can only be completely felt when the murmur of the ocean is stilled and the tides move stealthily along the shore. I held my breath against the night and watched the stars etch out their brightness on the face of the darkened canopy of the heavens. I had a sense that all things, the sand, the sea, the stars, the night, and I were one lung through which all of life breathed. Not only was I aware of the vast rhythm of enveloping all, but I was part of it, and it was part of me. He sensed that we were all connected, that we were all meant to be connected. But his life wasn't easy because of the place that he was born, the culture he was born into. He was smart, so smart. But the school in his town of Daytona, Florida only went to the eighth grade. And so in eighth grade, in order to continue his education, he had to go to boarding school. And he tells the story of packing up his trunk and gathering all his things and he had saved enough money to get onto the train. But nobody had told him that you had to pay a baggage fee. And so he's sitting there with the train in front of him ready to go to school and he can't. And so his tears are pouring forth because he's going to lose this opportunity to gain an education because he doesn't have the money to pay for his baggage on that train when a stranger pays the fee and Howard Thurman sets off to school. Howard Thurman didn't just stop at high school. He was seen as a brilliant scholar and went on to college and divinity school and became a teacher and a dean. He taught at Howard University and he taught at Boston University where he ended up preaching and teaching to figures that we know, because we don't know Howard Thurman, but we know the people that he impacted and influenced. It was during that time where he wrote the book, Jesus and the Disinherited, where he talked about how Jesus wasn't white, wasn't a white European, that Jesus was one of the disinherited, that Jesus was a poor Jew. He was trapped in a culture that was being oppressed by an outside force, that his life was not one of luxury, that his life was one of struggle, and that he knew that whatever he did, he would run up against the authorities who could put him down. 
It's a story of a young Jewish man who preaches of the love of God, of our connection to each other and our call to love one another. Who in that preaching and teaching, in that invitation to bring people into the love of God, ends up with his back against the wall ends up fighting against the forces of oppression and those forces fight back and execute him. Howard Thurman developed a theology of Jesus for the disinherited and it grew out of his own life because he has stories that he could share from every part of his life that were impacted by being black in America. He tells the story of how he worked for a white stone owner, store owner raking leaks. After he raked them in the pile, the owner's four-year-old daughter decided to play a game and would spread out those brightly colored leaves. She would scatter the whole pile and show it to Thurman. She did it several times until he lost his patience and told her to stop. When she continued, he said he would go to her father and tell him. Angry at his comment, the young girl jabbed him with a pen, and when he cried out, the young girl said, Oh, Howard, that didn't hurt you. You can't feel. The disinherited can't feel. They can't feel. Can you imagine being told that you, by a four-year-old child, can't feel? because you aren't important. You don't belong here. You don't have feelings. Maybe that's why it makes it easy to do things like we saw this week, where those police officers pulled over a van, a van that admittedly had been reported stolen months and months ago, but had been recovered the next day. But the notice that the police officers had been given was that a motorcycle had been stolen. But the police pulled over this van of four, four girls. And I literally mean girls. A six-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a 17-year-old who were pulled over in Aurora, Colorado, pulled out of the van, put down on the grounds with their hands behind their back. A six-year-old child with guns pointed at her. Maybe the police officers didn't think she could feel. Maybe they didn't realize that she too was human and equal. Because how could you be scared of a six-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 14-year-old? What would make you so fearful of them that you need not just yourself, but four other cops with guns to protect you from four girls? So Howard Thurman talks about the racism he encountered. In fact, he describes once taking his children back to see his home in Florida, his two little girls, and as they were exploring all his old haunts, they came across a, a swing set and the little girls asked to swing. And he said, you can't swing on those. And when they asked for a reason why Howard didn't tell them then, he said he would tell them when he got home. And these are the words he spoke. It's against the law for us to use those swings, even though it's a public school. At present, only white children can play there but it takes the state legislatures, the courts, the sheriffs, the policemen, the white churches, the mayors, the banks, the businesses, and the majority of white people in the state of Florida. It takes all these to keep two little black girls from swinging on the swing. That's how important you are. He taught, he taught his children what his grandmother had taught him. 
that they were beloved. That no matter the words that came at them, no matter what was said of them, that they were beloved. Howard Thurman teaches us that in the stillness and the quiet, if we listen, we can hear the whisper of our heart giving us strength to weakness, courage to fear, and hope to despair. So it, like I said to you earlier, Howard Thurman used to say that he could sit with his back against the tree and get that same peace he got while he was lying in bed at night. It would quiet his spirit and rest his soul. So I'm sitting out here against our oak tree. Um, probably not quite as big as the oak tree he was leaning up against. But I want us to spend that time in prayer so we can reach that peace and stillness where we can quiet down our spirit. And so the words I'm going to use in our prayer today are from Howard Thurman. And I invite you to, as I say the words, to let the word bring up what's ever in your heart. So I'm going to pause after each phrase. So take a deep breath and if you went out and sat behind your oak tree, feel that bark up against your back. I invite you to breathe in and to release it. Just breathe in and let it out. Lord, open unto me. Open unto me light for my darkness. Open unto me courage for my fear. Open unto me hope for my despair. Open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me love for my hate. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me as we pray together the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I'm glad you could join us for worship today. If you'd like to support our ministry, please go to stpaulshinkley.org where you can donate online or find an address to send us a gift. Join me as we pray together. God, we bring our gifts to the altar, and there are days when we are giving them out of fatigue rather than joy. We sing the hymns of praise and songs of commitment, but inside we're feeling spent out, like your prophet Elijah in the wilderness. Let me lie down under a tree and die rather than be sent out on one more mission for you. So show us one more glimpse of your divine purpose and inspire us again to get up and go into a needy world, not just our gifts, but dedicate our feet, our hands, our hearts to your purposes in our world. Amen. And if nobody told you today that I love you, remember that God loves you and always will, that Jesus loves you and always will, that I love you and always will. May you find a great giant oak tree to sit under. May you be still and quiet. May you find time to rest and center down in the presence of God. May you remember that you are beloved. Amen. Mm -hmm.